3D printing has a problem, and that is that 3D printers just aren't fast enough. It used to be that our 3D printers would move at about 40 millimeters per second. In recent years, we've had 3D printers getting faster and faster. It's not uncommon to see 400 to 600 millimeters per second of print speeds, and that's resulting in a 10x improvement in print times. So nowadays, you can probably consume two or three spools a day if you've got your machine really tuned in and printing something really quickly. But that's still not fast enough. So how do we get printers to print even faster? Well, to me, the answer is obvious, and I think it's print head parallelization. Basically, instead of using one print head and having that be your main bottleneck to how much material you can lay down, I think we should start looking at machines that use two, four, eight, 12, 16 print heads, however many you need to get the desired flow rate that is required. A lot of the motivation for this project comes from the fact that I made a trash can. And a lot of people think that this print is silly, but I've used it for all sorts of things. And this was about three or four kilograms of material. This took me 35 hours to print on a large printer that I had. It was the CRM4 from Creality, which I think is a pretty great machine. But who wants to wait 30 hours to get something made? So I designed and built this machine from scratch behind me using all off the shelf, you know, typical 3D printer enthusiast hardware. And I was able to produce this similarly sized trash can. It's actually heavier. This printed in five hours. So I was able to reduce from 35 hours to five hours. So that's like about a seven or eight times speed increase. How was I able to do that? So this is a massive machine. I've put a lot of work into designing and building this thing. I've been doing testing and really analyzing what makes 3D printers work in order to really push the boundaries forward for being able to print massive objects in kind of reasonable amounts of time. There's a lot of unique stuff about this printer. One, it's got four independent gantries with four independent tool heads that are all able to do their own thing. And I'm also using a polar stage at the bottom so that I can spin the part around while these four independent print heads are working. The very first time I turned this machine on, loaded it up with filament and ran G-code, this is what I produced. This is a little bin for a couple things that I have. Uh, always good to have little storage bins for your parts and chemicals around your lab. Then I produced these little rings. This thing flies great. It's like a frisbee and I can throw this hundreds of feet. It's a, a great little flyer and I think it could be fun to make some more of these frisbee things just to see how far they'll go. Then I produced this big hoop. Another cool project that I printed was this one. Um, I call this superimposed infill patterns. So basically I had all four of the print heads running the same g-code and it was just infill patterns that are overlapping with each other. So I didn't design the complexity of the part here. Most of this was just a byproduct of slicing it with different types of infill settings. I think it produces a really cool effect. And then I got to this part. This was going to be my world record attempt. I was gonna just load up a ton of filament and see how long I could print with this thing and uh, try and make a 20 kilogram print. Unfortunately, I only made it to eight kilograms, which is still a lot of material. I was pretty hectic. I live streamed this whole event of me trying to print this thing and it was a lot of fun. Filament changeovers wasn't something I had really thought through, so it was kind of a lot of chaos in the moment of trying to keep this machine fed. I was also having issues with bed adhesion, so I was literally screwing bolts into the bottom of the, the part to keep it held down. That didn't end up working and I was like, you know what, screw it, it's nine o'clock. I don't wanna stay up until six in the morning watching this thing finish printing a 20 kilogram trash bin. So I canceled it and uh, this is what we have. We got halfway there, it's a massive part. There weren't any failures of the hardware, it was just a software configuration thing. My brother helped me out a lot with this project and I chatted with a lot of people in the 3D printing community while I was building this. So, you know, this machine, it's also a product of the 3D printing community. It's pretty cool to just be able to bounce ideas off of each other and get things going like this. After my experience with this large print, this was using 0.8 millimeter nozzles, 
I got those nozzles upgraded to 1.8 millimeter CHT nozzles, so I was able to lay down much thicker extrusions, and that gives the, these prints this chunky look. And there's just a lot of cool textures and colors going on with these prints. So I'm really happy with how they turned out. And you can see these have like this kind of shimmering, weird, shimmering, glimmering effect. I don't know if this is coming through on camera, but they look really awesome. I went to Rapid TCT and I brought this little guy. This one's designed to be a carry-on luggage sized thing. And then I've got this one, which is a eight kilogram print. So about the same mass as this large one over here, but it's got thicker walls and it's made out of PTG. I actually have this thing set up in my bedroom as like a nightlight. I'm just using it as a piece of furniture. It's relatively indestructible up at the top. I've reinforced it. So it's almost two centimeters thick here. So these are, you know, they're like incredibly strong. I can drop these on the concrete floor and not be worried about them breaking. You can stand on them too. Uh, woo. So just really cool stuff to see 3D prints made at this size and scale and strength. Let's kind of do a bit of a deep dive into this machine. I'm gonna tell you about the pros and cons of this design and what are the things that you need to be worried about if you are going to build a multi-print head extruder machine like this. You need everything to be as rigid as possible when it's this large because just under its own weight, it's gonna bend if I'm using plastic printed blocks up here and I don't want things creeping and moving around. JLC3DP sponsored this video and I was using a lot of JLC CNC's machining services to produce my machined parts for this. So if you need to get parts made out of machined metal, I can highly recommend JLC CNC services. Most machine shops charge a lot for just doing one-offs, but JLC CNC, they have some way of producing G-code and making parts for not a whole lot of money even if you're doing low order quantities. It was really easy to upload the parts, get them quoted online, and have them in hand in as little as a week. If you wanna check out JLC3DP, I'll leave links in this video to their services as well. Now, we've all heard of IDEX printers before. In those printers, you usually have two print heads mounted on the same X gantry. You've got two different colors that can go back and forth and you can print with one print head and do one color and print with the other print head and do another color. The problem is that they rarely ever print with both of the print heads at the same time. And a lot of that has to do with limitations in the firmware. In Clipper, correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that you can only control four axes at a time. Ideally, you'd wanna treat that second print head as a separate independent axis. Then you also want independent control over that extruder. So then you're talking about a six axis machine. I'm not sure how they're able to do IDEX in Clipper. I think what they do is they change the pin assignments and they move that print head off to the side, then activate the other one and then print with that one. So they're not both active at the same time. Now there are the mirror and duplicate print modes where both print heads are printing at the same time. But in those cases, you're not treating them as independent axes. It's not really an IDEX machine. It's just a multiple print head machine. What we wanna do here is completely independent control over all the print heads and all the extruders. Everything that I've made is either circular or square or some type of four symmetric part. Now that limitation is sort of firmware imposed at this point. Since I'm running this machine on Clipper, I can only assign the same motions to all of the print heads at the same time and all of the Z axes at the same time, and all of the, the uh, extruder stepper motors at the same time. So it's pretty much locking me in to doing things that are four symmetric, but to get full independent control, I think is really the dream with this machine. If I'm able to get these all controlled independently, it's gonna be a lot of work in the firmware and also in the slicer to get this working fully. But you can imagine like if I had an oval then you have all of these four print heads able to move in and out in order to trace the perimeter of that oval. That's where the, the real potential of a machine like this is really gonna come out. That means I can print any generic shape I want with four print heads at the same time once I've figured out how to get them all controlled individually and uh, produce the sliced G-code for it, which I think I should be able to do 
It's just a matter of time and, you know, just developing this thing. So there's a lot of hurdles in the firmware and slicer side, but there's even more fundamental problems when you think about how the alignment of a machine like this occurs. It's easy to think like, oh yeah, you build the machine, it's got a X shape arrangement of those print heads and they can all print and they move in and out and yeah, everything's great. But in practical use of this machine, I realize that there's a lot of different ways that it can be misaligned. Even the frame of this machine, you might think that, oh, it's a cubic frame, you've got four bars going up, and then when the print heads move up and down, they're all just going to move straight up and down. That's not the case. When you're at the bottom, and then you move to the top, those print heads could drift in or out, depending on how parallel all of these columns are. You're never going to be able to get them to be perfectly parallel. And if you do, that's going to require a lot of equipment and like laser alignment procedures and all of that. So I just think it's really not practical to be able to do that because let's say you're moving it and you drop it a little bit and then it bumps on the floor and then the frame slightly bends. Or let's say I enclose this machine and I heat it up and cool it down. There might be some thermal stresses that build up that cause things to slightly click over just a little bit and then any kind of precision alignment that I've done will be completely invalidated. Just looking at these two columns here, you can imagine they could be closer together at the bottom and further away at the top. They could both be skewed to the side. They could be out of plane with each other. The actual extrusions themselves could be bowed or twisted. There's just a million ways that this thing could be misaligned and you have to come up with ways to compensate for all of that. That either has to be done with precise machining, precise alignment procedures, or you can compensate for that stuff in software a lot of the time as well. You can see on these prints, some of these colors will be kind of embossed or debossed relative to each other. I mean, really, they should all be stacked right on top of each other, but some of them are in a little bit, some of them are out a little bit. When I moved from one print head to another, the layers didn't stack exactly down on top of where the previous print head was. And I would do manual tweaks and adjustments to get everything to line up, but there's just simply too many degrees of freedom to get it to work because, you know, things might be offset forwards or backwards or might be off at an angle or, you know, maybe the print head doesn't even intersect the zero point, which is a whole nother issue of its own. So there's just a lot of issues with alignment on this machine. Now I was able to get away from most of those issues and ignore them for the most part by just using really thick extrusions. I've been thinking about how can I guarantee that when I assign one print head to move to one place and then do some rotation or whatever and then have the other print head print on exactly the same spot, how can I guarantee that those are gonna be in the exact same spot where I expect them to be. That's really where a lot of my attention has been focused over the last month. And this gets me into a whole nother topic of print frame alignment and precision required for 3D printing. If you think about it, these nozzles, I mean, not these ones, these are 1.8 millimeter nozzles, but a typical 3D printer nozzle is 0.4 millimeters wide. That's incredibly small. So you're laying down these really thin pieces of plastic and then you're moving over by a precise amount and then laying a piece of plastic right next to it and those have to smush together just right in order to get proper adhesion between those two pieces of plastic. And that's requiring sub tenth of a millimeter precision. We're literally talking about microns of precision in order to get 3D printers working properly. And you might start to think like, wow, well, since it requires so much precision, how, does, how do these 3D printers even work in the first place? Well, you're in luck because I've got another video planned on that. I've been printing out some test parts and uh, you know, checking the squareness of my printers. The truth is that your 3D printer isn't straight. It's not gonna be perfectly perpendicular on all the axes. But in the end, it doesn't really matter because it just works. So I just wanted to give you an update on this machine and what's been going on with it. Despite this thing being very large and expensive and complex, I had a great time building it. It was quite easy. You know, I learned a couple things here and there that I might want to do different on the next revision. But it's been a lot of fun and I've learned a ton about building 3D printers by going through this exercise. Just use the machine and you'll figure out what you need to do to change it to make it better. That's kind of the best way to go about 
designing uh, products that people end up using. I'm actually thinking about selling these, so I've put some listings up on my website. Now, keep in mind these aren't going to be cheap. They're being printed on a one-of-a-kind machine, and the material costs on these guys is pretty significant. I feel like this video has probably gotten to be a little bit too long already, so I'm going to sign off on this one. Let me know in the comments what you want to hear about this machine. Uh, big thanks to JLC3DP for providing the funds to be able to build this machine, at least in terms of providing machined parts. And uh, also Luke from Luke's Lab for providing the hot ends, and Bontech for giving me a discount on the extruders that I'm using here. That's it for this episode of Nathan Builds Robots. If you want to learn more, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode.